1985, Angela Davis wrote, progressive art can assist people to learn not only about the objective forces at work in the society in which they live, but also about the intensely social character of their interior lives. Ultimately, it can propel people towards social emancipation. Progressive art, the forces at work in society, intensely social, propel people towards social emancipation. Could these phrases be describing hip hop? USC professor Todd Boyd believes that hip hop is indeed propelling people towards social emancipation. In an NPR interview, he states that hip hop is inherently political, the language is political. He also suggests that Martin Luther King and his politics are very specific to a certain time and it's important for us to learn from that. But if we wanna talk about the present and the future of hip hop, it's much more immediate, much more relevant. It is 2008. We need relevance. We need bridges to take us positively into the future, as activist Angela Davis said. We have to talk about liberating our minds, as well as liberating society. As rapper Tajay from the Souls of Mischief says, mind our own and own our minds. Let us bridge, let us move forward. I am not a rapper, I am a poet with a hip-hop style. If you like what you hear me do today, please check out my website. It's www.notarapper.com. All right, now, um, the piece I'm gonna do to start off with is something new on my new project, an album I got coming out called Radio Friendly. Um, I've grown and lived in Washington, D.C. and PG County my whole life, so I haven't heard anything on the radio that represents the way my life was coming up, so I did a little piece. So if there's anybody want to keep the snap along with me, feel free to, all right? Imagine a go-go groove. Imagine Chuck Brown or Northeast Groovers or something. We'll keep a swing to it, all right? Here we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Got lots of brothers making cash where I'm from. The largest black middle class where I'm from. But can get up in ya, uh, where I'm from. We make it look easy from PG or DC. Sling everything from real estate to rocks where I'm from. And every fourth brother rocking locks where I'm from. We about to take back our blocks where I'm from. We make it look easy. Check it, PG County School veteran, the law goes straight from Kettering. I learned my skills in Mitchellville. There ain't nothing better than the way we got down. Black town in the background, hear that sound. Conga player laying that smack down. Moved here from uptown when I was yay tall. Back in the days at Cap Center and Landover Mall. Doctors and lawyers on the block, hustlers all around the clock. Bam, my ain't about where you from, it's what you rock. We got our own culture, own and economy. Produce so many stars, it's like studying astronomy. We got black love. Of black music, black businesses, we're strong, black families, we don't lack witnesses. Well, summer's hot as hell, and when it got that hawk, watch when you go after dark or get outlined in chalk. This is where the revolution gon' spark, where the Million Man March was a walk in the park. Uh, got lots of brothers making cash, where I'm from. The largest black middle class, where I'm from. But can get up in your, uh, where I'm from. We make it look easy from PG or DC. Sling everything from real estate to rocks, where I'm from. And every fourth brother rocking locks, where I'm from. We bout to take back our blocks, where I'm from. We make it look easy. Check it, I'm an uptown resident since Carter was the president. And if you need some proof, then my swagger is the evidence. Back in the 80s, you needed a hood past the inner. But now the Chocolate City got a marshmallow center. Got pushed off U Street because we couldn't afford to buy it. Had recovered from the fires during the 60s riots. Record labels try to bite us. Out of town is one of the fighters. <laughs> Don't even try us, I'll show you what we have. Take a trip up Georgia Ave, HU's got a staff. They all up in the lab, teaching science and math. In any other class, KDY's a different path. You can find quarters and halves, they take what they can grab. And brothers always clash, finding brothers doing bad from the farms of Trinidad. But I ain't even mad or hardly even sad, cause these are my people and they all that I have. Uh, got lots of brothers making cash, where I'm from. The largest black middle class, where I'm from. But can get up in your, uh, where I'm from. We make it look easy from PG or DC. Sling everything from real estate to rocks, where I'm from. And every fourth brother rocking locks, where I'm from. We about to take back our blocks, where I'm from. We make it look easy from PG and DC. Thank y'all very much. Okay, so.
So as you all may or may not know, today's topic is the divide between the hip hop generation and the civil rights generation, or shall I say, the civil rights generation and the hip hop generation. So we have Omani come up and give a little feel for the hip hop, and we have Betty come up to give a little feel from the civil rights. So as, as our performers and panelists begin to, begin to approach the stage, we would like you guys just to get your minds around the topic because at the end, we're gonna open the floor up for questions from the audience. Are you all with me? Wonderful, okay. So at this time, I would like to introduce the Humanities Council's Executive Director, Joy Ford Austin, and she's gonna give some opening remarks. Can I get a round of applause for Joy Ford Austin? and getting us ready, centering us, as they say in New Age language, and uh, preparing us for what is going to be a very fine discussion. And I know it's gonna be a very fine discussion because that's what we do at the Humanities Council. We bring together people like yourselves who are interested in thinking and talking about the city and thinking and talking about ideas. Ideas that improve the city, ideas that engage us in the work of the city, ideas that bring the world to Washington and Washington to the world. So I hope that you'll enjoy the next hour and a half. It is a pleasure to have all of you here today. Um, I, their panelists will be introduced shortly and appropriately, but there is one panelist that I would like to present to you at this time, and that is the council member, Kwame Brown. The council member has been a very good friend of the Humanities Council, supporting it um, over the years. I think we all know his devotion and his interest in supporting business and economic development in the city. But one of the things that I particularly admire about council member Brown is that he understands that people want to have a livable city. They want to be engaged in Washington, D.C. And so, and he cares about young people. He cares about young people and their leadership development. And so a program like Our Soul of the City is of great interest to him. He cares that we engage our elderly. And, and so programs like our oral history projects and our historic preservation efforts are also important. So, Council member, I wanted to give you this award. Oh, well, award. An award. And it says, Champion of the Humanities Award, presented to the Honorable Kwame R. Brown, Council Member at Large, by the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., April 14, 2008. Thank you. <laughs> Well, let me just say we want to, of course, hear and get the panel discussion started. I, I just think when you have a the panel discussion talking about the hip hop and the hip hop generation and the civil rights generation, this is we need to have more forums and discussions like this because I think that today you will hear, of course, you know my generation challenge the older generation and the older generation challenge my generation. We need to continue to have these type of dialogues and discussions to really deal with some of the major issues that are gonna to continue to face us as we move forward over the next five to 10 years. The goal of it is for you know, my kids to be living in a world that's different. And hopefully, you know, it'll be different than the way we leave it. And the only way I can do that for my two-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old, is to continue to have these discussions, but to implement what comes out of these discussions uh, so they can have a better life. So thank everyone for joining and to the board of the Humanities Council for the work that you do. Because that, the Humanities Council is very important to this city to talk about some of the historical uh, past that have taken place and to challenge us to think differently. So to uh, the executive director and the board of directors, the work that you do every single day, I didn't know I was getting an award. I probably still wouldn't award a tie, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to thank you. We look forward to the discussion, God bless. Now on to the main event. I 
Uh, once again, my name is Bomani Armah. I'm a long time, well, lifetime DC and PG County resident. Um, I'm a poet, a hip hop artist, an educator, and an activist. Last summer, I made a little bit of noise with this song and video called Read a Book, um, which got a lot of attention in the press. Um, Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Push Coalition officially came out against me, um, said whoever made the song was uneducated, illiterate, and unkempt. Um, I told him I'd give him unkempt, but you can't, can't give me the other two. Um, <laughs> And so I'm passionate, I mean, the song and what I do in my life is really based around my two passions, which is um, popular culture, music, and media, and young people. And I love showing young people that they don't just have to intake media. If they can't find stuff on the radio or on television that represents their lives, their aspirations, that they can either find it or create it. Um, and and you're amazed, I'm amazed at how much the young people aren't really as blind as we think they are once we give them an option different than like the thug life that's being sold to them. So. That's, that's where I'm coming from on the panel. And, uh, Angela Davis said we need to build bridges. And that's what I was discussing with Harry earlier, that we need to build bridges. If we just have a discussion about hip hop and we just kind of walk out of here and everything remains the same chaotic way that it is now, then what good is meeting at the Martin Luther King Library to discuss hip hop? We have to take from here um, and what we discussed today and implement it. It has to be, we have to put it into action. Are you following me? So. Um, we're gonna reintroduce Professor Griff. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Griff, how y'all doing today? Hi. I'm God having a human experience called Griff, and um, hopefully you can say and do the same every single morning when you wake up. I don't approach my artistry from an artist perspective, I approach it like the God that I am, that's within me, are you following me? All right, so I'm ready to get this started. Welcome to the Terror Dome. It's, the, uh, it's good to be here to discuss uh, not just hip hop, but to celebrate Emancipation Day which is a day that we should never forget about. Is it, is it on? Look at that, see? Give one, help one. You see that? This is a perfect example today. Uh, it's good to celebrate it. This is a celebration of Emancipation Day also. Let's not, uh, let us not forget that. But also to really deal with this issue that the country and the nation is struggling with. You read about it in the newspapers, people stereotype, you know, the hip-hop generation, and we're going to define what is a hip-hop generation uh, versus the older generation, and to really deal with how do we build a balance between the two and have, a, hopefully, an honest discussion. And you know, anybody that knows me is, I'm a, we're going to keep it real here today. And we're going to say some things that some of my good friends sitting out there are going to be mad about, uh, but hopefully they go home and sit in their chair, in their comfortable chair at their house, and realize that what we're talking about today needs to be changed, needs to be addressed in a way in which we start with, with oneself. So thank everyone for coming out. My name is Cheryl Denbo, and I work with the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, and I am very honored and terrified <laughs> to be on this panel. Um, I have spent about 30 years working to make schools more supportive places for African American and Latino students, and for the most part, I have failed. So I'm very interested in looking towards a new generation to do better than I did. I am the curator of the African American Civil War Museum at 12th and U Street Northwest. I am principally a historian, and I come from a tradition of continuous history of our African identity. I had the great fortune of being tutored by my big mama, Stella Whitfield, and my great uncle, Martin Jones, growing up in Oklahoma. I am what I'm going to call a cusp baby. I am not, I was born in 1958, so that 1965 uh, cutoff with the civil rights generation, I was born during the struggle, but I came of age during a time of unprecedented liberty. And I am here today because of the victories of that struggle, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and without further ado, I would like to call Moss Tedeschi to the stage, and she's going to kick the whole panel off. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Moss Tedessa. I'm the Director of Communications for the Humanities Council. I'd also like to plug our website. If you're not familiar with what we do, we'd really like you to take a look at wdchumanities.org. Um, just for some clarification purpose of today's discussion, we would like to make clear that those deemed to be members of the civil rights generation were born between 1947 and 1965, and those we deem being representative of the hip-hop movement are those who are born from 1965 to 1990. 
I wanted to also um, tie together a good definition about the hip hop generation as well as the civil rights movement. And I found something that I felt really defined it. Um, Bakari Kitawana, author of The Hip Hop Generation, Young Blacks in Crisis in African American Culture, and a former editor at The Source, identifies blacks born between 1965 and 1984 as belonging to the hip hop generation, a term he uses interchangeably with black youth culture, Generation X, applies mainly to white, he says. He calls, the hip -hop, he calls hip hop arguably the single most significant achievement of our generation, yet blames it for causing much damage to black youth by perpetuating negative stereotypes and providing poor role models. But this book is about much more than just rap music. It takes a broad look at the state of post-civil rights black America and the crises that have come about in the past three decades, including high rates of homicide, suicide, and imprisonment at a rise and a rise in the single parent homes, police brutality, unemployment, and blacks' use of popular culture through pop music and movies to celebrate anti-intellectualism, ignorance, irresponsible parenthood, and criminal lifestyles. Serious problems indeed, but Kitawana acknowledges that members of this generation have more opportunities than their parents had and believes there is still time to make positive and lasting changes. I wanted to provide you with a statement just so that you get a sense of where our dialogue is going. Now, without any further ado, Don Murray, the chair of the Humanities Council, is going to be facilita facilitating these panelists. Um, I'd like to start it off with um, just one quick question. Uh, and I think it's important uh, that we get into, what do you think, uh, when people think about the Civil Rights Revolution, uh, and this is for, the, for all the panelists, when people think about the Civil Rights Revolution, what comes to mind? And to follow that up, I wanted to ask the same question. When, you, when people think about hip hop culture, what comes to mind? Because I think part of it is that in, in many ways, I think that both of them have a lot of things that are similar and a lot of things that are different. But I think it's important that we start off by saying, what, for, for you, what did the civil rights uh, revolution, I would say, mean? And in your mind, what were you doing in 1968? when we began, and many people began to see the, in many ways, the demise or the sort of the closure of the civil rights movement and the beginning of the movement in terms of hip hop culture. So I'll go back. The first question is, what does the civil rights revolution mean to you? Uh, where were you in 1968? And I'll come back to the second question. And we'll start with, let's start with Bomani. All right. Um, well, uh, I wasn't anywhere around here in 68. <laughs> Considering I was born in 78, uh, um, I know my generation um, holds the civil rights generation in a lot of esteem. Um, we definitely feel disconnected, though. Um, it, it doesn't seem like it was our parents. It seems like it was a whole group of people that we don't really know. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, well, I think it's going on in this generation. The, previous, the hip hop generation was battling against the American government and the system. Um, I think the hip hop generation was first battling against you know, parents and you know, just the, the angst of being young and then the community situations that we were in. Um, originally hip hop was about, um, I, I like saying hip hop was about um, taking what you have and making it into what you want. We didn't have art in the schools, you know, it was the middle of Reaganism. We didn't have art in the schools, brothers created art anyway on the subways. And um, I think my generation, the hip hop generation started off by being really creative with what we were, we were dealt um, and then got horribly exploited in the early 90s by, um, by corporations and multimedia companies and, and, that, and that the civil rights generation didn't know how to deal with us. Uh, it would have been beautiful if we can go back in time and find a way for the two generations to have met at that point. And the civil rights generation helped promote the aspects of hip hop that were positive. Um, but we ended up having a big clash in the, in the mid 90s that led to the corporations completely taking over and the culture that I love like stopped representing me. You know, I'm a grown man with a business and a family and I can't see anybody on television who looks like me um, saying that they're part of the hip hop generation. So that's hopefully one of the things we'll get into today. Um, I heard Malcolm say that we need to look past civil rights and move towards trying to gain human rights. Um, I think that was the ultimate struggle. But in 1968, I was eight years old, so I didn't have a clue. But I seen what was going on, and I seen enough to ask uh, my mom, who was a single parent, what's going on? Um, then when Marvin Gaye asked the question, what's going on, I, saw, I was old enough then to kind of look into it. So when you talk about revolution, revolution is complete, constructive, conscious, cosmic change. So when you talk about civil rights, 
revolution. I seen civil rights change some things in the immediate community where I live. I seen hip hop revolution. Hip hop uh, meaning higher infinite power healing our people. I seen that revolution, the mind revolution that public enemy set in motion change things on a global scale. I was talking to, the, to Cheryl earlier and we were talking about um, how hip hop um, is a blessing and a curse. How hip hop has the, uh, the medium of the internet and the media working in its behalf. And I told Cheryl, it may be a blessing and a curse because have you heard of Soldier Boy? You understand what I'm saying? So that may be a blessing and it may be a curse to know that you can make a film one night, put it on YouTube, and make a song the same night and get it across the globe instantaneously throughout the globe. That may be a blessing and a curse depending upon the message that you're sending out and to who you're sending it out to. So civil rights revolution and the hip hop revolution has something in common. And we need to dive into what that is today. I'm going to leave that open. Thank you. I think in 1968, clearly I was born in 1970, so I was probably <laughs> something called a, a thought. Uh, but I would imagine 1968, my father was, of course, uh, dealing with SNCC. I'm a civil rights baby, so many of you know that. I grew up around civil rights movement. And to me, civil rights means organization. When I think of civil rights, I think of organization. I think of hard work. I think of uh, family values, I think of family, I think of community. Those are the things that come to mind when I think about civil rights um, as, as it relates to, I think, a social movement. I think of a social revolution. Okay. Uh, I think of something called, they say, by any means necessary. I think that what has happened from the civil rights generation to my generation, any means necessary, didn't bring along the definition of any means necessary. And that's why you see in some areas of hip hop, you see people are still trying to improve from the social to the economics, but the economics sometimes takes on a bad way of any means necessary. Because yes, people are still prospering, but they also are still prospering in a way that's demoralizing to our community. Well, civil rights emerged from an intact African American community. The teachers and the lawyers and the doctors lived right beside the, wor the workers the, and the kids went to school in the neighborhood, right? Martin wanted civil rights, but to a better society, a society that didn't have poverty, a society that didn't have war. Uh, but Malcolm said, that's never gonna happen, along with the Black Panthers, and they said, a separate community. But the truth is, the young people thought Malcolm and Martin, and I was young then, <laughs> Malcolm and Martin were old guys. They were old guys like the parents, and what we wanted the most was not to be like our parents. We found our parents to be pathetic. If we were poor, we found them to be pathetic and irrelevant. If we were middle class, we found them to be pathetic, boring, and irrelevant. We didn't want to be like them. But of course, what happened is that some People who were poor left and became middle class. They moved out of the black community. Some people who were already middle class became middle class. And we left a ghetto isolated by class, isolated by race, poor and angry, and I think justifiably so. Uh, it was very clear to me from the beginning that this was a new art form. It was very clear to me that this was a significant social statement. Uh, it was very clear to me that my colleagues, both black and white, were a little bit ridiculous when they complained about the music, but not about the culture that it reflected, not about the poverty that the music came out of. So that was clear to me. Um, and again, um, uh, uh, Professor Griff said, when I think of the civil rights movement, I think of a movement that's trying to get to people, but how did we do it? We did it in churches, we did it in synagogues, we did it by demonstrating and hoping the paper would represent the numbers accurately, which they never did. And when I think of hip hop, I think of an immediate electronic community who can communicate with the world, and I envy that. I envy that power, I envy that potential to create a worldwide revolution to do it much better than we did it. What does the civil rights revolution movement struggle mean to me? 
First, it begins long before the 20th century. Men like Prince Hall, Richard Allen, George Lawrence, who began the struggle for enfranchisement and the emancipation of Americans held in captivity, Africans held in captivity. Their struggle continued through the Civil War with the accomplishment of ending the tyranny of slavery. But during the war itself, there was a very clear stand for civil rights by the soldiers who refused to take the inequity in pay because they understood that if they did, they would be accepting second-class citizenship. So they were involved in a civil rights struggle, a struggle that continued to the day that I was born in 1958. I came of age in terms of understanding there was a world out there where there was a need for a struggle for civil rights when I was five years old. My father was a civil rights leader in Oklahoma, and we were cautioned to be very quiet about what was going on because there was an active terrorist campaign being waged against our community. In 1968, I was almost 10 years old when Dr. King was assassinated. My mother said that a new day was dawning than though Dr. King had been assassinated. I was responsible for keeping his legacy alive and living the resurrection. So what does the civil rights movement mean to me? It means that I have a responsibility to carry on a legacy, a verifiable commitment to liberty and justice for all, to include all of hip hop. Uh, what happens to young people um, in the hip hop generation when, when they begin to see the world around them with new eyes and a broad vision? As people got a new vision and a new sense of the world, found a new voice, how have, how have you, from, from your perspective, where do you think the generation, where are they going with it? Because I think that's I been think, part of the struggle. I think, um, the, I think it, there's, a, there's a breaking point. Um, it, it really happens right around the time of NWA. Um, I tell people all the time, people accuse the hip hop generation of inventing drug dealing, pimping, and murder. Um, <laughs> we definitely didn't invent it. We were the first generation to be honest about it in our music. Um, there, was a, there was a time and a place where hip hop was balanced and um, we were talking about the realities of the street. I think at first the hip hop generation was excited about having this new voice. Um, our struggle wasn't against as much the system as it was what's going on in our own community, like I was saying earlier. So we were excited about having the voice, but that voice was not embraced. Um, I'm actually working on something right now that I'm calling uh, the Immaculate Conception of Hip Hop. And it's basically about how the, 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 the previous generation talks about the hip hop generation like they aren't our parents. Um, you know, the hip-hop generation, you know, is disrespectful, or, you know, uneducated, um, money-driven, and I'm like, okay, maybe, but y'all are parents. Like, where did y'all drop the ball? Where, what, why is there this disconnect? What happened in the 80s where we lost the fervor that happened in the 60s leading into the 70s? And it's not even, it's not even about a matter of placing blame, um, but I want to make sure that this is the last generation that looks at their kids as, and their culture as being completely separated from ours. Um, there, there are times and there are moments in the history of hip hop where instead of um, boycotting, you know, saying the language we were using or the dress that we were doing, you could have found the aspects that, you, that, that the civil rights generation liked and promoted that. Put money, energy, um, the, 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 the little bit of press attention that black people garnered at that time behind supporting it. And hip hop, I don't think, ever got the civil rights generation support. Hip hop got the civil rights generation's denials and accusations after it turned gangster. Um, but even now, you know what I'm saying, we hear people wanting to boycott all day, but they're brothers like myself and other more popular artists who are doing positive hip hop. And uh, something that me and the friends of mine are, are proposing now is our culture needs to do no more boycotts. You know, we're not protesting against anything anymore. We're gonna do a boycott from now on. Um, instead, of pro uh, instead of protesting against the music we don't like, we find the brothers and sisters who are creating the art that represents our realities and our aspirations. And we find people from the previous generation who, who understand media, who understand money, who understand education, and putting energy behind promoting what's positive about the culture. Because it's still out there. Um, the gangster bling culture has not completely taken over. They just have all the money and energy behind them. I'd just like to say real briefly, there's a book entitled The First Millennium Edition of the American Directory of Certified Uncle Toms. On page, <laughs> on page 236, it talks about the nefarious niggerization of rap music. And um, 
Romani was absolutely correct. NWA was the first group to come out of that. And NWA was basically set up, you know, uh, after, after probably about the first album, set up to basically neutralize Public Enemy and conscious hip hop. And from that moment on, it went from gangster to balling to thugging. And right now, I think we're in the pimping phase of hip hop. And all of that's by design. And we have to look at it that way. And we can, we can put that on one side, draw a line, and we can draw a direct parallels from what the civil rights movement had went through. Public Enemy was in a position to the point where we tried to bridge the two. You heard Jesse Jackson on our albums. You've heard Dr. King. You've also heard Minister Farrakhan, Ava Muhammad, and other brothers and sisters, Stokely Carmichael. And what we tried to do is have young people understand, look, if you only listen to the music and understand it, you would get those life lessons. But like the brother said, we didn't get help from the civil rights uh, leaders. But, you know, I have to say, it's true. I think that you were let down by my generation. I, I really do. And I think, you know, we were glad, I mean, we thought we were rejecting everything that was about it being adu adult, and we thought we were rejecting everything that was materialistic, and yet, you know, we packed up, we got our education, we left the ghetto, we left it, either if we were African American or white, we left it in every way, and then when there was reflections back about what was going on, we wanted to cover our ears, we've made better prisons and schools. So I'm with you there, I'm really with you. But at what point do you say, do you stop saying, it's my parents who didn't understand me, or it's a capitalist system, you know, and maybe now there are hip hop people in the capitalist system that's making money, because, you know, we left the ghetto and it festered and it didn't, it didn't thrive, but you guys, not maybe the people who are here, but the hip, many of the hip hop generation made role models. I see, I see young women, smart young women, pretty, pretty young women aspiring to be hoes. Me, you know, I mean, that's worse than just leaving. That is really worse than just well, can, leaving. Let me just, let me, can I just finish, just let me just sum this up. Dr. King said in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So when you talk about prisons and schools, the hip hop generation don't give a damn about the school or the damn prison. You understand? Because they ain't telling the child, as far as the average hip hop head is concerned, telling the child to stay in school is like telling the prisoner to stay in prison. So hip hop was the voice of the voiceless and we brought all those things out that a lot of people, especially my parents, just didn't want to hear. And we said it and wasn't afraid to say it. But let me, let me say this, as you look at uh, one of the do little work is make as much money as quick as you can without putting a little effort. You know, some people's parents taught them that. As you say, you left, a, you left something called the inner cities, but you created the mentality. You say, what do we do now? Well, it's time for the generation that came before me to step to the side. It's time for you to stop holding back our generation. You, you gotta understand what I'm saying. What is happening with the older generation is come this mentality where they're so happy to get to where they are that they want to continue to hold the younger generation back right. and not exactly. let them nourish flourish. So you say, you know, what are we gonna do? That's why I ran for office because I got tired of being sick and tired of people saying what happened in, 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 in civil rights. And I, I have it's a two way street, right? When I started to run, nobody wanted to talk to me. Everyone decided that they were going to, you know, you're too young, you're too this. Every excuse why you can't achieve in life, right? You see where I'm going? But, but then it came a point where I had to listen to the wisdom. See, we have some of my friends, they want to make money quick, fast, in a hurry. They don't want to do no work. And then when it comes to people with gray hair, they don't want to listen to them. So I know that you're driving a car looking out the rearview mirror, but what I need you to do is move to the left lane and let me get by. And so many times, everyone is blocking. You're blocking your kids. You're blocking your kids' friends. But then you say, what's wrong with these young folks? These young folks are frustrated. Yep. They're frustrated that they go to school with, kids, with buildings that don't work. But their mom and daddy talk about how things are because they drive a Mercedes. They're frustrated because they want to start a business and no one will help them out. And yet their own mother and father are successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> they're frustrated because mama is never, doesn't have a job and daddy ain't around, so therefore they feel as though that's their destiny and don't want to help them. They tired of them telling, their parents telling them they 80 just because the fact that they never graduated from college. So I, I understand what you're saying. How do we move forward? And I say we move forward two ways. One, if you're young, hip-hop generation, whatever you want to call yourself, fight for it. 
One thing I learned from the civil rights movement is they fought for it. No one ever gave you anything. Yeah, the second thing is you gotta listen to the wise, for those that are really wise. Some will tell you, say that they're wise, but they'll tell you a hundred reasons why you can't do anything. Right, tell you need to go to school more, you gotta get a PhD, your D, my D, you gotta do a bunch of different things just to succeed. Now what you have seen in the hip hop generation is entrepreneurs. You've seen a movement in which Malcolm and which Martin Luther King talked about. How do we free economically so people can live and create wealth in their communities? And what you have had is, a, is no one giving them the direction to talk about how to do it in a positive way. And the people that are telling them how to do it in a positive way have been so bad and so, so disrespectful that people don't want to listen to them. Do you understand where I'm going? So how we move forward from here is, is two things. We need your help. I need your help. My kids need your help to get out the way. Let me, let me, I'm gonna follow you. In a respectful, in a respectful manner, I say that in the most respectful way that I possibly can. Let me, let me say this. I think I want, I want Hari and, and Cheryl to respond to this. Is um, as a person, I'll use myself as a person who grew up in the civil rights generation. Uh, one of the things I had to recognize, and I think. We both have to learn this. I'd be interested in, in Cheryl and Harry's take on this. Is that you have to recognize the intelligence, history, power, and diversity of both movements. In other words, I think that what has happened in many cases is, and I, I just mentioned your response. I think that part of the problem is we haven't taken the time. I had to listen. I, I didn't like hip hop. I had to listen to it. I had to begin to realize that there were some some different strains to it. I, I, I had to begin to realize there was some power to it. I had to understand it. I just think that there is a unwillingness in many ways to, to understand and learn from another generation. I think that, that when people think about hip hop, they have, they, they have this negative stereotype about the, the, the imagery and the language and I think that I mean, I remember my kids listening to De La Soul and, and you know, Public Enemy and a whole bunch of other people. And, and I said something when I didn't like the other side. I mean, it wasn't that I said don't listen to it, but I did say to them, you know, think about this. What are they saying about them? when they make these lyrics? What, what does that say about your sister, your aunt, your mother, your grandmother? How do you want to respond to that? Well, I'm in an area that uh, I don't real, really feel comfortable talking about, candidly. Because if it came to a video from a hip hop artist where a woman was shaking her beauty or whatever they're doing, I would be less concerned about that than my son watching the movie Glory. How many of you were told that it was a true story? It is a false story, absolute lie, that is defamatory. But we allow it to go into our schools 19 years after it came to the theaters advertised as a true story. Anti-intellectualism. Denzel Washington's character, Trip, like he's on some drugs, y'all, doesn't want to learn to read and write. He was in a regiment, if it was the true story, that didn't have a single man that was a runaway slave and almost every one of them could read and write. That's the true story. That's the image I would want my child to see. So what we have to do is become more sophisticated. Start examining the way our history is presented in the schools. Stop all this commentary about an art form, everybody. Allow the art form to produce the beauty that it can produce, and let's move forward. But let's move forward by telling our history honestly. Not this false history that comes in the movie. What kind of hypocrite do we appear to be when we tell our children, read a book? Now watch Glory, it's a true story. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do, but it's in the area of history. And hip hop artists have been calling us on this. They've been asking the questions. What's the truth? They've been doing the research. If a young, young man, a young woman watches the movie Glory in your classroom, then goes to look at a Robert Gouchard's actual letters, he, he thinks you're not very bright. Why? Because it's so different from the truth. So we are going to have to deal with this. And I see as a member of the civil rights generation a responsibility for correcting the inaccuracies in history 
so that our, our hip hop artists are better armed. Mm. Can I, can I answer the question about what, what can we do now? If we pay attention, if we look through all the bling, we look through the bright lights and the money that's happening in the videos, our students are concerned with things, our young people are concerned with three major things that they aren't being taught in in school, all right? Business, sex, and being a revolutionary, all right? There's no classes in high school and middle school about owning your own business. The rappers talk about being self-employed all day, owning your own record label or selling crack. One way or the other, I'm not working for the man. I, I'm gonna get a job, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm gonna work 25 hours a day for myself. Um, if we can start incorporating information about business in school and, in, and, and promoting artists who, who promote a different side of business other than the crack dealing side of business, that would affect the young people immediately. The music that I do, I go into Oak Hill, I go into some of the baddest high schools in the city, and when I talk about my struggle as an independent businessman, they're riveted because it's what they want to know about. The next thing is sex. Um, we don't want to talk about sex, especially in the black community, but everyone's talking about it except for the parents. Um, and unless we give them an accurate description of what sex is, they're gonna learn all of everything they know from the music videos and, 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 and the radio. And this means being real too, being real about, I mean, it's to the point where, of course, you know, with young people, with elementary and middle school kids, we don't even want to use the proper name for sexual body parts and stuff like that. And they, they just learn about it from whispering in the hallways and listening to the latest Soldier Boy song. We gotta have correct, information about sex and sexuality incorporated into our schools and incorporated into the music that the young people listen to because they internalize it and they memorize it. And the other thing is about being a revolutionary. All these young people really want to do is be a badass, all right? Um, and they, they see the drug dealers and the gangbangers as being those. Being the drug dealer is not going against the grain anymore. Everyone expects you to be the pimp, the player, the drug dealer. If you want to go against the grain, you got to be the positive brother. You've got to be the husband. You've got to be the father. You've got to be the business owner. And what we have to do is stop letting just the stories about 50 Cent, the real 50 Cent, just the stories about the real Rick Ross, the real drug dealers be the ones that come out. And we gotta stop acting like us people trying to do something positive for the community are soft. No, we're not. We're, this is the hard work right here. And if we find a way to portray those images in the culture that the young people are already familiar with, they will gravitate to it because they're already interested in that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, Don, yeah. can I just say that you know, we, everyone's kind of mentioned a number of different things, but the absent part of all this, whether you're part of the civil rights generation, hip hop generation, is we need parents to be parents. And until we get parents and family values back into the homes, then we're gonna continue to have the same issues that we have now. Now the civil rights generation, you know, did a disservice. And to a certain degree, they've done so much to let me and provide me to be what I am today, but on the other side, they left something called family values, hard work, community commitment. You don't even see that. That didn't come. These kids aren't learning about 50 Cent because they just watching videos. There's no parents around. So today you say, what can we do? I think the first and foremost thing that we have to do is get some of these parents to be parents and get some of these civil rights generation people to not just talk about how their son is not taking care of their kid, but show this. And they had the only reason why they ain't taking care of their kid because somebody ain't taking care of them. So when you go into the homes, of whether you're Latino or African American or whatever, where you see strong family values is where you don't see some of this foolishness that you continue to see on TV or, 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 or what's going on in the streets. You got these kids, uh, hip hop generation, some of us, we just don't love ourselves. And we don't love ourselves because the civil rights generation ain't love us. And so man teach us how to love ourselves. So if you don't love yourself, then you'll never understand slavery. You'll never understand what it meant for you to be an African American here today, and what your ancestors had to go through just to get here. Can, so can, can I say something to that? I think um, we all remember the 50,000 that went down to Jenna, Louisiana. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. You see, the hip hop generation tried the method of the civil rights generation. And that way is old, it's tired, and as you can see, it just didn't work. There was no hip hop theme, there was no song that went along with the 50,000 that went down there. We went down with the same old tired slogan, no justice, no peace, and at the end of the day, what do we get? No justice, no peace. Are you following me? So we need to understand this. So the hip hop generation tried these different methods, and it just don't work. It's nothing wrong with putting the old way to bed, there's nothing wrong but with that. What we need well, to do is have we gotta remix it. We got to remix the old. No, well, we don't want a puffy <laughs> remix because that's something else. But what we need the civil rights generation to do is pass the baton back and help guide what we need to do 
for the future. There's a document I have here from the um, FBI files, and it talks about the, um, the Negro wants and needs something to be proud of. The Negro youth and moderate must be made to understand that if they succumb to the revolutionary teaching, they will be dead revolutionaries. There was no one there to protect young brothers like me coming up trying to understand why a city's burning and why are people are rioting. Do you understand what I'm saying? I had to go out in the street and get it. And that's something that hip hop um, had taught me. It's like, okay, I can speak out, but if I speak out, I gather bear the brunt of the entire government and everything that they uh, have brought on, the people that uh, put on the heads of everyone that went before me, I gather bear the brunt of that. So I was there and I seen how they dealt with Malcolm. I seen how they dealt with Martin. Hip hop generation today, seen how they dealt with Tupac and Biggie. These are unresolved issues with us as a people. Am I right or wrong? No, come on, talk to me. Am I right or wrong? These are unresolved issues. And if we in the hip hop generation seen how our parents' parents handled how they dealt with Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, we say, damn, we got to go for ourselves. And we did. So sicking dogs and water hoses on the hip hop generation? I think not. I think not. That's just not going to happen. Not nowadays, especially not with me. I don't know about you, bro, but anyway, that's just not going to happen. We are taking a different approach to how we're going to deal with some of those unresolved issues that our parents should have dealt with a long time ago, and they haven't dealt with them. Let me, let me I want to follow up on this. I think it's an important point. What happens every day in black communities where we're shooting people, where drugs are going on, and there are no marches, there are no, I think what people are saying is, what's the alternative? Because in, in, in some ways, a lot of what the civil rights movement and the hip hop movement was driven by the media. The media, in many ways, drove people's attitudes, they drove their behaviors, and they drove how the society responded back to them. But and I guess what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to get at is this whole question of at what point, is sort of what you're talking about, at what point do we take control of the process? Because I would argue is that the only time black people get mad is when white people are involved. But you got to understand some revolution is not an event. It's a process. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah. So if it's a process, then we have to understand the process. And if we went through the process and through the era of the civil rights movement, we have to take the best of what they left us to deal with and build upon that. But who gave us the script? When hip hop began, there was no script. No one said, okay, this is, this is the, the mode that you follow. Here's the script that you read from. Hip hop was something that we did. And hip hop, keep in mind, was cultural while the civil rights was political. And what Public Enemy tried to do is fuse the two and let people know, look, we're dealing with some political, cultural issues here that we need to get a grasp on. So that's what Fight the Power spoke to. Bring the noise, welcome to the Terror Dome, 911 is a joke. These songs spoke to that and we encouraged our peers to kind of follow suit, and they did. But then, what happened? I, I think, I think oh, the- Wait a minute before, I gotta give her a shot at it, then come back. Over the past 40 years, descendants of Africans in America, now Americans, have experienced a degree of liberty unprecedented in the nation's history for a generation of African descendants. I want you to appreciate this hip hop generation, that you are experiencing liberties that were unthought of by your ancestors. And the reason is because of soldiers, frontline soldiers who are among us like Frank Smith Jr. and Lawrence Guyot, Marion Barry and uh, John Lewis, frontline soldiers that ushered us into this unprecedented generation of liberty. The reason you're able to stand and say we wouldn't put up with that is because of the victories of these frontline soldiers. Liberty. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bayard Rustin were generals on the front line. And they left us a legacy of liberty. Now, some will say, well, you, they might be abusing the liberty. Well, I think it's your right to abuse it, but I also think it's your obligation, your responsibility to make something better of it. And I believe, honestly, of the many young people that I know, that that's exactly what's happening in this country, and we've got to focus a little bit more on that, what the hip-hop generation contributes, and what the civil rights generation has contributed. Well, let, let me say this. Uh, I know Mr. Guyot, Mr. Smith, Mr. Barry, uh, never met Mr. Rustin. And we argue all the time. And, and, and the reason why we argue is because why I have a tremendous amount of respect for what they've done and the doors that they've been able to open, we still have to challenge them to change some of the ways that they think. 
Uh, as I sit, as you know, next to Councilmember Barry, and we argue all the time, because as I tell him, you have something that was started called the Mayor's Youth Leadership Institute. And it was supposed to be designed in the 80s and 90s to make young people give them a voice, let them be their elected leaders. But I didn't see any of the civil rights generation people helping any of those young folks that came out of the Mayor's Youth Leadership Institute. I've seen a generation of 10, 15 years where they let these young brothers and sisters and Latinos, whether you're male or female, go to the wayside. So yeah, I am frustrated sometimes as I talk to them because they could have done more. You could have done more. And today they still can do more. And until someone stands up and say to these young folks that are sitting out here today, if you ask them right now how many people have they even tried to help them do anything, they'll probably shake their head to some degree. Yeah, we give them a speech and we tell them what has taken place in the past, but until you give these young folks an intern, and until you give them an opportunity of hope, until you expose them of all the wonderful things that they're exposed to and I'm exposed to, then we're leaving another generation behind. Music. See, hip hop ain't just to me it's about rap music. Hip hop is about a way of life. And the only way there could be a way of life is that people are now operating within their own scope of what they've been exposed to. And until that changes, then you're not changing the frame of reference at all. But until you change the role of economics, we will continue to have this problem. Until people are trained, until they, people have job training, until they have access to money, until they open up the avenue of creating a better life, then you're not going to change any of the stuff that we're talking about. And every, that's the real conversation, Mr. Murray, is until people have access to money and wealth, then they don't have access to anything. We don't lack a generation of people that are uneducated. Ed we have the most educated generation that you've seen. We lack people doing something called blocking. And until they're changed, and I think you will see politically those people change. God bless them for the work that they had, but I think you got a generation of people that are tired of being sick and tired, and we're going to get rid of all of them until we get what we have, and that is economic prosperity, which helps us raise our kids, which helps us give them a quality education, which helps us do what? Help people retire. And that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, in the most respectful way that we possibly can. <laughs> I think the hip-hop generation sees the issue as something different. You were talking about the Gina Six situation. Um, the hip-hop generation was a little bit involved. There was most deaf, there was dead prez. There was like the quote-unquote conscious scene. But the main problem with the hip-hop generation getting more involved with something like Gina 6 is that we don't see our struggle as us versus the man, I don't think, as much as the civil rights generation did. The civil rights generation created some space for us. There's still racism, but Gina 6 situations to our generation seems to be sporadic. What our main struggle is us against what we're doing to us. Um, that's, that's what we're struggling with. We're struggling against the drug dealing, we're struggling against the gang banging. These are black on black issues and most of our music is revolved around it. One of my, one of my biggest concerns is the glorification of the crack trade. Um, every rapper, if you look, seven out of every ten rappers is a, a former gang banging or a drug dealer in the Billboard Top Ten. I have to say about six or seven out of every ten. And the problem is we're not accurately telling the story. Like the, the crack head doesn't have an album. The crack baby doesn't have an album. Um, and we need to tell those stories. So our young people, like literally, if you were born in 1990, you think the 80s, everybody was rolling around in Audis, you know what I'm saying, giving away money. And really, we were losing brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and cousins. So we need to get an accurate story told. And we need to have the civil rights generation. I tell people all the time, the money that it took Oprah Winfrey to do that one episode where she berated hip hop, she could have picked an artist she liked and spent the same amount of money and promoted him to the world been like, this brother has an accurate representation of black life, y'all should buy his album. He would have sold a million in two days and it would have it started, you know what I'm saying, the leveling of the playing field. And what I'm really concerned is, crack is not the last epidemic that's gonna hit our community. There was heroin, there was crack, and the next thing is gonna be something that I, don't, I won't recognize. And our children won't be prepared because the, the, the storytelling, the history of our culture is hip hop, and hip hop is not accurately telling what happened during the crack epidemic and how we should have battled the crack epidemic. So when the next plague hits our communities, our kids are gonna start from square one again. And the hip hop storytellers need to start telling the story accurately so when, so when you know, the next drug epidemic hits, we don't go to the president, oh, you should throw all the drug dealers in jail. You know what I'm saying? Drugs should be like, no, we've been through that one time, but I'm betting you, when my kids become 16 and the next epidemic hits, we're gonna approach it the same way we 
did in 84, and then we're going to wonder what happened. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's no reason in learning history if you're going to keep repeating it. And hopefully the civil rights generation will help my generation tell the story accurately so our kids will get it right next time. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, each person if they want to give uh, uh, sort of a, a one or two minute takeaway from, from what they've heard in this discussion, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. Because I think that we've talked long enough, and I think it's important that people in the audience have a chance to ask questions to the panelists. Start with you, Harry. The civil rights soldiers never received their VA benefits. When a soldier comes back from war, it's been the tradition of this country to give him some VA benefits, some veteran benefits. When we talk about reparations, I believe that we don't have to go all the way back to the period of our captivity, often called slavery. I believe we can go back to that active period of terrorism being waged against our, ter our communities. And those who came of age during that time often suffer from a post-traumatic stress syndrome. Those soldiers that went to war on the battlefields in Mississippi, Alabama, in SNCC and other organizations, in the NAACP, the SCLC, they deserve veteran benefits. So I believe that one of the things that will help us move forward is when we as younger folk really get together and start working for the veteran benefits of our trailblazers. And I'd like to conclude by saying it will be a better world when we appreciate those who have done just a little bit for us to make it possible for us to be who and where we are. Cheryl. The civil rights activists had a dream, a dream of a better society, uh, a dream of lifting ourselves up spiritually to different social conditions. And I think that Obama is coming from that tradition. He's giving us hope by actually talking about race by actually talking about racism. But he's different than any politician that I've seen before because unlike other mainstream politicians and even unlike many non-mainstream politicians, he is talking about getting beyond anger, confrontation, and blame. I think he would agree that we need to make a revolution. Um, and it's weird, we need a new American revolution and it it really weirds me out that the next American Revolution might actually come from the political mainstream. So I'm very hopeful. Well, it, it's, it's been a, a very interesting dialogue, and I, I think that as we move forward and listening to some of the panelists, not really, the question is what can they do? Here, the civil rights generation asks, "What can they do to help?" You know, the hip hop generation is something that I, I don't think I've ever heard before. Most people are telling people what to do, as opposed to how to help them do something. Um, I do believe that you're right; that it is going to take, you know, a political climate to help change some of these issues with the right political people. Until you have job training in which people in the hip hop generation, many who have finished high school, you know, does not have a place to be able to be employed. And when people are unemployed, they're frustrated. When people have bad health care, they're frustrated. When people's grandkids can't read, write, add, subtract, they're frustrated. So, you know, your question is what can what can we do? You know, we can take it back to something called you know, making sure that those that have the least receive the most. I look forward to, to moving forward, and that is in working collaboration with those of wisdom, but also doing something different, Don, doing something different. And that is saying that we're just gonna to continue to buck this system until we buck people off. And that's the only way to do it. I, I don't know any other way to do it but to fight hard. So thank you, Humanities Council, for holding this forum. I hope we can have more of these. I think we need to have more of these in different areas of the city where people can have these type of discussions and dialogues and we can talk about how do we move forward in a way and be educated in a way. But if they don't have a library in the schools, then I don't know how they can, you know, read things they can tell them about the history. If you don't have computers in every school, then I don't know how they can be able to, to operate. If you have a library that needs to be renovated 
and like this one, that I don't know how you get, what are we telling our kids that they come here and the heat don't even work? So we have a number of different challenges before us that we can do to help move this discussion forward. So thank the Humanities Council. Professor, yes? Can I have a show of hands of everybody that's really listening? Because <laughs> I'm feeling some energy in here. And it just seemed like we've heard it all before. And to be honest with you, I'm sick and tired of it. I'm, I'm not a talker, I'm a doer. And I think that's what we need to become. Uh, I was talking to Cheryl earlier, and I think we, um, we agreed that we knew who the, the leader was in the community back in the day because you've seen them. You've seen them doing the work. Um, you playing armchair revolutionary and hiding behind your computer, that's not going to get it. That's not going to help raise the consciousness level of young people. Man. Young people have taken this hip-hop frequency, and they will move over your ass for real if you don't move out the way. So we respectfully respect the fact that you're being respectful. <laughs> but young people today want a new way of doing things. And I think that's the first thing we need to think about. Before all of this is all over, um, you know, when they're spreading ashes on our graves, we need to, before that happens, we need to ask the question, you know, seriously, what would we tell our children? That we met at the Martin Luther King Library and we had a two hour discussion and we kind of came up with nothing. Seriously, what will we tell our children? Everyone that's a parent or a grandparent in the audience, what are you gonna tell your children about this hip hop thing if you don't understand it? If you can't interpret these soldier boy lyrics to the average young person, and it's actually letting them know that you're really truly degrading yourself and your sister, your cousin, and your auntie. See, Tay Tay, Man Man, and Pe Peanut, and Riri in the projects, they don't know how to interpret these things. Are you following me? So the civil rights, generation and movement never interpreted the struggle to us. The Black Panther Party interpreted it to me. I understood that. I understood Malcolm. To a degree, I understood Dr. Martin Luther King, even though I didn't agree with him. It took me a long time to agree with him and understand his method. So what are we going to tell our children? And before it's all over and said and done with, we're going to have to deal with racism. Barack Obama, he's making a, hot, a half-hearted attempt, and I understand what he's trying to do. But we really got, get, got to get down to the nitty gritty and say what this is all about. And we need to figure out what are we going to tell our children. We need to stop taking band-aids and trying to put it on headaches. That method is just not going to work. We got to be up front and real with young people and speak their language. You can't, if they speak in Spanish, you can't come speak in Italian and expect young people to understand. So we have to understand that. So I want to leave here. We're giving people my phone number, whether you take it down or not. 678-557-2919. 678-557-2919. All of those that really want to make a change and really want to do something other than talk, I believe the panel, the panelists here really want to do something. Am I right or wrong? That we have to make things happen. We have to be accessible and reachable. And we have to truly make things happen. And just be a man and a woman of your word. Don't come talk hip hop today and act like you're down with the cause and you're not really down with it because young people are dependent on those of us that supposedly know to help them guide them through this thing. So once again, 678-557-2919. Please don't call me breathing hard on the phone, threatening me and all that kind of madness. Just give me a call and let's build. Peace. All right. Cool. Um, one quick thing. I'm, I'm becoming recently really stickler about language, and we can discuss this later, but I think we use the word revolution too much. I think mostly, we're, too loosely, yeah. I think most of the people, most of our leaders, most of the people we revere are reformists. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a reformist, but a revolution and a reform are two different things. In my dreams, I am a combination of Denmark Vesey and Che Guevara, but in reality, I love my Netflix subscription way too much. So that's something we need to start talking about. Um, the other thing is, what we really, I hope we come away with today is using the culture to educate. Um, Karis, one term, the, the idea, edutain. I mean, I think we definitely got to start doing this. Um, we think that our young people don't want to hear positive messages. When I bring positive messages directly to them, they eat it up. They eat it up big time. And what happens is the radio and the video are giving them anthems. Um, um, Rick Ross, 50 Cent, Young Jeezy are giving them hustler anthems that they know like the back of their hand. All right? but, and we take, 
right? We take creative writing, we take music, we take dance, we take art out of the schools and leave and don't let them create their own chants, their own rhythms, their own mantras to, get, to guide them onto the next level. And we let corporate media give them their mantras. I'm a hustler, I'm a, I'm a hustler. You know what I'm saying? Um, at the coffee shop all day, they're singing songs, talking about how great it is to sell crack to your neighbors, you know what I'm saying? And what we have to do is start using the culture, let the young people themselves, because they live in these communities, analyze the problems and give them the power and the tools to use the culture to create the anthems that will, that will lead them to the change that they're trying to create. And um, I personally, that's what I do for a living. So if y'all want my car, come up to me. Um, I'm definitely, both personally and professionally, very involved in trying to let young people understand that they can create their own anthems that reflect you know, the dreams and aspirations they're trying to make. One, I want to thank, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to ask a question. I want to thank all the panel, and I want to make two comments. Uh, I think one of the things that you hope people take away is that uh, even though generations may be different, they each can learn from each other. As a former uh, teacher myself, one of the keys is, you know, how do you, how do you teach and learn about this? I mean, I think that part of it is, and, and we, did, we weren't able to do that in a this, this short period of time, but part of it is you've got to begin to think about what is the power and the influence that each of these movements have within the, the context of not only our community, but the world. Uh, one of the examples I always use is we shall overcome was when they go to Poland, they talk about it. When they talk about it in South Africa, it's the same thing in terms of hip hop. When you look at the language, when you look at uh, uh, hip hop started out as a musical phenomenon, but it's a cultural phenomenon, it affects everything. And I think that one of the things we, we are so caught up into what we see in, um, uh, in our daily lives that sometimes both of these movements had tremendous power in terms of how people in the world view us. And, 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 and the challenge is, no, no matter how much money you make, if you don't have a vision, and uh, 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 the, the, the great thing about hip hop to me was that it allowed people who never had a, a say to, to uh, create and to innovate and to in many ways reposition the society and the technologies and the culture to begin to get out a message that they would not normally have. And I think to a large extent, when you look at the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement talks about social change. It talks about a way of life. And you always hear hip hop people talk about, this is the way you live and learn throughout your life. So I would like you at least to begin to think about, for many people, that both of these things begin as a way to begin to shape and say, this is the way I live my life. And this is the way I want to live my life and begin to think about it that way. Because I think if you don't put it in a larger context and begin to see the power, and I always say the intelligence. I mean, I think that a lot of times there are a lot of things as a teacher around imagery and subject matter that I had problems with hip hop, but I could not teach it because why? Kids were interested, excited and interested in it. So it became a jumping off point to begin to get them to think, of, to get interested in history, to get interested in economics. And so what you do is you take the, the, the point where they started and use that as a basis. So I just hope that the discussion today begin to say to you, for the people in the older generation, let's go out and begin to get a better feel and understanding of the process. And I think for young people, you have to say that, we, how did hard earned, how did your individual freedom come out? And where do you end up in terms of collective benefits? Because the challenge now is that people so I can go and play my video game, I can create my business but they have no sense in many cases of collective struggle. And I think what the civil rights movement, the power of it was that it created a vision where it wasn't about gaining wealth, nobody got it. And I think that sometimes people forget a lot of the people that were involved in the civil rights struggle were involved and they got killed. They were murdered. The question is who's doing the killing and the murdering now? Goes both ways, but I think you have to look at it and I'll shut up and, and any other, I wanna thank you for coming. I, are there any questions you have for the panel? Get ready to uh, open the floor for discussion. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Um, get ready to open the floor up for discussion. If right here. I oh, you want to? May say, um, in the interest of time, if we could limit our comments very briefly or questions, make them very brief. I'm going to start right here on this side. Okay. Move around so everybody get a chance. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I don't have any questions. I have an answer. Um, I was an educator in DC public schools for 10 years. I was an administrator for one year. And 
I'll tell you this, one of the problems we have in our communities is we don't have a real leadership structure. Not just in black communities, in everybody's community. I am a product of the civil rights movement. My parents, they raised me on the grounds of read or die. <laughs> Educate yourself, read or die. There was no do or don'ts. But I'll tell you something, I see accountability way up here and responsibility way down here. I'm gonna call it like it is, that's the problem. I'm not gonna blame that on hip hop because, and I can't say that's really an achievement gap either. The problem is we have a community of people who have lost responsibility for younger folks. That's what's going on. You know, we got a whole, I'm sick of people playing the blame game. The middle schools blame the elementary schools. The high schools blame the middle schools. The colleges, when those kids get in remedial classes and, and they can't get past their sophomore years, they blame the high schools. It's everybody, it's a community's responsibility to be responsible, culpable. And it's, it's everybody's responsibility to say, even though that's not my child, there was always somebody there to say, even if I stepped on somebody's grass, I'm gonna call your mother and tell her that you stepped on so-and-so's grass. I was afraid to be, you know, just not responsible. I mean, we have to get back to a culture and a community of responsibility. It's not really a revolution that we need. It's, re it's really people helping other people. It's camaraderie in the truest form. Good afternoon now. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Davia Walker. I'm actually an educator currently in DC public schools, have been for 13 years. Um, and I actually have seen um, children from my youth who are now adults, Dwight Franklin over here, and one of my former educators, Ms. Constance Razza. So right here in this room, we already have a very close connection of people who have actually been a part of the civil rights movement, grown up in the civil rights movement, have been called part of the hip hop movement, Generation X, the lost generation, all these type of things. But the thing that I say that we all should take away from you know, this general discussion is that education is powerful. And if we don't educate ourselves, continue to educate our children and make sure that they understand how poor, important education is, we all will lose out. We all will lose out. And I think I originally came in here thinking that the chasm was really wide between civil rights and hip hop. It really isn't. We brought up the same things over and over again that we really do want the same things. We may be going about them in different ways, but the bottom line is we do want better. Thank you. I have a question specifically for Kwame and um, Cheryl. I think that one of the biggest things is uh, there are so many voices unheard, and I'm curious, particularly we have Bomani, and we have a host of DC artists that shouldn't be knocking on different doors. They should have their doors knocked on. And I'm curious, particularly Kwame, how do we get that? How do we make that happen? Where do we get those gatekeepers to allow Bomani to be coming into these schools? Or there's um, the prison poetry, a play. Where do we, how do we open those doors and allow those choices to come into our schools to allow them to see different pictures? And how do we not just discuss it and talk about it as a good idea, but to execute it and create a mandate to get these choices available to those students? Well, let me say that first of all, it started by something called education reform. If you'd asked me last year, you know, I would have had to call the superintendent and hopefully they would have called me back and then he would have gave me to an assistant superintendent who may have called me back and then, you know, we would have been going around the Robin Hood barn on why we think this is a great idea and they would have told me what they've been doing for the last 20 years and how that's great, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for DCPS. I'm a graduate of DCPS. Uh, but now I think we have a more direct approach in which we will, you know, whether you agree or disagree, as a legislator, it's easy for me to get access to have the conversation, to push to see how we can get more of this into our schools. As before, it, it just wasn't there. So when you say how can that happen, I think we can start that movement of that happening now. Like, for instance, I never knew he wanted to get into a DC public school. So today, I've been, you know, 
I'm educated. Of course, yeah. Now that I know, you know and I know he'll love me, don't you agree? He will call and talk to me about it. But now that I understand that, now we can work on how we get there, so I'm all open to do that. Cheryl? I think first we have to get out of the headset that there are good guys and bad guys, you know, and that the, the good guys were the civil rights and the bad guys are hip hop or vice versa. The good guys are hip hop and the bad guys are civil rights. I think we have to figure out, now that we're here, and maybe my generation didn't do the job it had set out to do, now that we're here, now that we're here now, what is it that we can do? And I think you had terrific suggestions about, I've been, I've been talking about getting entrepreneurship into middle schools. I mean, there are lots of programs already developed that we could just put into middle schools, but we don't do it. I think that's a great idea. I do think it's a fantastic idea to t teach revolution. You know, there's a guy named Moses who did a math program. I don't know how many of you are, but he came from the old civil rights movement of getting people agitated about not having their civil rights. And what he did is he applied those principles and he got young people agitated about not taking algebra. And he really changed schools in terms of who they left out of algebra. So I think, I think we need to teach revolution because kids are angry and they're frustrated and they have to know how to, how to do that, how to change their lives, how to make change that's constructive for them. And I think we have to, we, we have to bring in hip hop people and to talk about hip hop and to, and, and to talk about what the potential is of hip hop is, both positive and negative, and I'm definitely getting your card when I leave. So I, I think this is a good very first step because we're polarizing and, and, and stereotyping each other. And you know, while I will take responsibility for the failures of my generation, what I really want to know is what can we do now? What is it that we need to do now that we don't have you know, kids going into schools that are just deadening their minds and their souls? Yes, uh, my name is KC Wilson, more affectionately known as Care for the Evolutionary. One question I had is that we talk about the media and what they're doing and the corporations and what they're um, pushing to our children. But one question I always ask, is there a counter you know, attack? Is there a counter strategy? Because if they're spending millions of dollars and taking psychologists out of the colleges and putting them in marketing firms, Where's our counter-marketing firms for education? Where's our counter-marketing firms for conscious hip-hop? Because I, I, don't, I hear a lot of you know, the organizations and the corporations and Time Warner, but we don't have even a counter-strategy to go after that. So my question is, is there one available? Is it in development? Because I'm considering developing one, but if there's something already available, let me know. Huh? <laughs> there, there, there are... Um, there are people all over the place trying to make positive hip hop music, um, both videos, music, movies, art. Um, I know personally, like I just started a record label, it's called Insoroma Records, and I, I have a staff of about 9,000 people. That's everybody on my email list. Um, I told them all that you know it's me and them, so they need to pass it around. Um, I think the, the, internet, the internet has definitely leveled the playing field. Um, so we got to make sure that we use the internet, that we use um, these hip hop websites that aren't completely controlled by some of the bigger corporations, and we got to start making it personal. And like I said, there are people with money and power who are spending money and power. Um, I, I, like, I have issues with like, the Enough is Enough campaign, um, the ones who, who protest in front of Deborah Lee's house. I wrote something on my blog, I was saying, the same energy they used to use a 1965 technique and, and you know, protest around in the corner, they could have gotten all of these people at a computer emailing all these kids on MySpace and sending them to hip hop artists that better represent our aspirations and our lifestyles. We, gotta, we can't destroy it all the, all the time. We have to start promoting. And I think we have to do it on a personal level. I'm not sure where the money's gonna come from until, until some of the bigger corporations see some money in it. But at a personal level, the internet has leveled the playing field and we have to use it as much as possible. I just, well, I'd like to say just one last thing. Um, is there any possible way we could leave the audience with our email addresses or something? Because um, we need to get some kind of feedback. Like you said, it'd be cool to have something like this. We can yeah. actually, if you would like, we can put your information on our website. Right. Could, could you please do that? Because without being connected to the people, I mean, what is all of this for? Well, right. I want to thank you on behalf of the Humanities Council for thank attending you. this wonderful event. Um, before we completely close out, Mr. Murray, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Uh, I had to say this, but I'm not a gay queen. One of the things that Kwame did, and he knows this, 
when he ran for office, one of the first things he did was knock on my door, and one of the first things I did was take a sign, support him, and give him some money. Oh, that's and so I think one of the things that happens is that, I think that the one thing I would say to Kwame is that there are people out here who are gatekeepers, but there are also people out here who want to support you, want to encourage you in terms of what you want to do. And I think the, 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 the important thing is that we have to do, maybe one thing I take away from this conversation is we may have to do a better job to identify that we want to support and help you. But at the same time, I think the, the other thing comes out. And I just think that, because I think it's important. I, I think it's important that people know that there are people in their lives who recognize what they have is of value and that we owe it to you to support you to do it. And I think that's important. And I think there are more people than you think that will help you. I think part of it is we have to do a better job of saying it. Thank you, audience. Have a wonderful afternoon and come again. Good night or good day.